So today's discussion is about partnership. The basic definition of a partnership, the one that comes from the restatement, is an association of two or more persons. Persons can be either natural persons or legal entity persons. So you can have a partnership that consists of two individuals. You can have a partnership that consists of two limited liability companies, two corporations, a corporation and a limited liability company, a person, a limited liability company, a corporation. Partnerships can consist of uh, any combination of persons, whether natural or otherwise. The person who needs to claim a, the, par the partnership exists, the person who's uh, asserting partnership as the grounds for liability, is the person who carries the burden of proof. And so they have to show that there are two or more persons engaged as co-owners, and we'll talk about what that means in a second, in a business, for profit. Okay. Uh, in the case of partnerships, we are looking for people who are working together as co-owners in a business in order to make money. Well, one thing you don't need to show is that you don't need to show an agreement. Right? In fact, there are no requirements of any particular kind of formalities in order to create a partnership. There's no form you have to file with the state no kind of agreement you have to have. In fact, you don't even need to have an agreement in order for there to be a partnership. Uh, in fact, you can have a partnership by accident, right? Meaning you could not have intended to create a partnership, but nevertheless, in hindsight, be deemed to have created one and have all the consequences that flow from that uh, bind you anyway, even though that wasn't your desire. In fact, what you characterize your arrangement as will not be dispositive. The question is whether or not uh, you have gathered together two persons who act as co-owners in a business for profit. And the important thing uh, to look for in determining whether or not there is a partnership are one, a division of profits, right? Are you sharing the upside of the business? is the way in which the co-owners or the two persons or two or three or four persons are participating in the fruits of the activity of the business, is it based on some percentage share in what's left over at the end of the day rather than some fixed claim like so many dollars per hour or some other kind of salary, right? That actually, if that is present, is deemed to be prima facie evidence of the existence of a partnership. So look for that. And the other factor is control, right? T to the extent that a person who's participating in the business has the ability to control the business, the ability to affect day-to-day -day decisions, the more they have that ability, the more they are likely to be considered co-owners. And to the extent that that kind of decision-making and managerial power is shared among the participants in the enterprise, the more likely it is that they're going to be found to be co-owners in the business and therefore the more likely they're going to be found to have created a partnership. I think a useful way of thinking of a partnership as, is as a box, right? And in, in the box goes the business, right? And what does that mean? Well, it goes the assets and uh, the obligations, right? So. In the asset side, you have things like uh, land, a building, money, right? And on the obligation side, you have contracts and um, debts, right? Maybe, okay? And amongst other things. But all the stuff that is necessary in order for this business to operate. And on the outside of the box, you have partners, right? the people who are the co-owners of the business for profit, right? And the question is, what is their interest in this? What does it mean to be a partner in this box? What, is, what, is, what do they own when they own a partnership share in the box, right? What does P1 have? And let's assume they're all one-third partners, even Stephen. Is it true that since this person is a one-third owner, that let's say there's $100 here, does he own $33.33, right? And does P2 own $33.33? And does P3 
uh, three own thirty-three dollars and thirty-three cents, or do they share in a third of whatever debt it is? Do they own one third of, let's say, there's an acre of land, they own a third of an acre each? And the answer to that is no. What they own is a one-third interest in this collective thing called the partnership. Right? They own the economic rights that stem from that, the one-third share in the profits, the one-third obligation to share in the losses, which we'll talk about. They own a one-third share in the, or in the managerial rights associated with the business, assuming that hasn't been modified by contract. Okay. Their ownership level, and this is the way to think about it, is outside the box. It's up here, right? And what they can transfer is that one-third position in the economic and managerial rights of the entity, not their one-third position in the underlying assets or obligations, okay? And that's important to keep in mind. There's a distinction between, there's a certain separateness between the partners and the partnership, right? And that's a useful uh, uh, way of keeping things uh, clean and orderly in your mind, okay? So if I were to want to sell my position in this partnership, what I would be selling to X over here is simply the standing, the right to stand into this position of having a one-third position vis-a-vis -vis my other partners in the co collective thing called the partnership. Okay? I'm not able to sell one-third of the money, one-third of the land, one-third of the building. Okay? And that's important to keep in mind. Now, I say if I were to sell, can I sell? Right? The answer is, in theory, yes. But in order to do so, absent an agreement to the contrary, right, I would need the consent of all of my other partners. Now, why is that the rule? Well, there's this notion in partnership that par partnerships are personal, that they're consensual, that they're clubby, club-like arrangements, right? And so I can't willy-nilly foist a stranger onto my partners. They have to decide whether the new guy uh, or gal should be allowed into the club. And so they're given by absent an agreement to the contrary, uh, the rule that they have to consent to the substitution, right? But if they do, I could transfer my position uh, to uh, this new person. We're going to see in so many matters that relate to partnership this notion of default rules, right? And then the power to change those rules by contract, okay? So default rules are the rules that are provided by statute and by common law, absent an agreement to the contrary among the partners, right? And I think that phenomena that uh, the law provides a rule if you don't have in a contract that uh, provides to the contrary is one that's going to be seen throughout our study of business organizations and in fact defines the space where business lawyers work, right? We're the ones who come up with these contracts that supersede the default rules because uh, among this group, the default rules don't fit. Right. And we'll see that um, almost everything that relates to the ownership and governance of a partnership, with a few exceptions, you can change the default rules. And the real question is, if you don't change them, did you get the rule that you wanted? Because is the default rule suitable for what the client uh, who's doing something here intentionally, as opposed to the one who gets stuck with a partnership after the fact, uh, is it what they actually wanted, or should you have written something um, um, differently? Okay, so we talked about default rules, and I think uh, it's worth going through the major ones. So, first of all, so the economics. What are the default rules on the economics of being a partner? Uh, the default rule is that partners are entitled to equal share in the par par partnership's profits and are responsible for the partnership's losses in the same proportion as they share profits. Okay. Now notice, that was a very uh, purposeful way of putting it. I, I, and you would think, well, why didn't I just say they have equal share in profits and losses, right? Because if they have equal shares in profits, to say they are responsible for losses in the same proportion as they share profits is basically to say they have equal share in profits and losses, right? And it sounded like I uh, tortured the English language in giving uh, the description differently. But 
it is important to understand the difference, right? So if there is not an agreement, because these are the default rules, right? If there is not an agreement between the parties, and let's say you have four partners, right? Absent an agreement, they each get 25%, okay? But they can agree differently. They can say, oh, well, partner number one gets 50%, partner number two gets 25%, and the other two partners share uh, the remaining 25, 12 and a half each, right? That is absolutely doable uh, if that's the deal between the parties and that's what they want to specify in the agreement. Now, if that's what the parties intended, but they fail to put it in their agreement, well, then they're stuck with the default rule, which is even Steven equal, okay? Now, the, if the partners had written down that their uh, partnership arrangement was, as I said, 50, 25, 12 and a half, 12 and a half. Well, and, but they were silent as to how the losses were going to be allocated. Uh, the way I stipulated the default rule was losses follow the way profit shares are given. Well, in that case, then the same 50, 25, 12 and a half, 12 and a half would become the default rule absent an agreement to the contrary, right? And so you see why it was important to define losses as uh, a second, as, as following how the profits are whacked up, because it's very common for people to think about how to uh, whack up profits. That's very common for someone to have thought to write that down. It's also very common for them to forget how, how to whack up losses. And so the default rule says, we're not going to revert back to even Steven to losses. If you think of how to divide the profits, we're going to follow the same rule for losses. Okay. But of course, you can divide the losses up differently than the profits, but to do that, you have to write it in your contract. And then I just note here that there may be some limitations on how you can do different rules for losses versus profits uh, under the uh, tax code, but that has nothing to do with uh, uh, partnership law. You, you are free to make those completely different. Uh, it just may not be respected by the IRS. What else do we care about in a partnership? Well, how about management? Okay. Who gets to decide? Who gets to make decisions? And the default rule in management is one partner, one vote, with majority rule being, uh, for most decisions, the uh, decision-making uh, idea, right? the criteria. Right? So again, again, that uh, rule, that default rule can be altered by contract, right? So, for example, in our case of four partners that were 50, 25, 12.5, and 12.5, is it likely that the intent was to give those partners one vote each, right? Or is it more likely that we were going to give this person uh, twice as many votes as this person and these people just half as many votes, okay? That's a good question. Now, you can do it either way. Even though the economic rights are like this, you could give them equal voting rights, and that's in fact what the default rule would be, absent an agreement to the contrary. But in all likelihood, uh, you're probably going to give people proportional voting rights, proportional to their economics. Right? But again, if you don't write it, this is what you get stuck with. Okay. Similarly, in this kind of situation, Right? You could imagine, uh, uh, in this case, if you lived with the default rule, in order to make a decision, you would need these three people to agree, or some group of three to agree. Okay? But if you ended up with this kind of uh, arrangement, right, and you uh, ended up with the default rule, you could allow two people, this person plus anybody else, would end up being a majority. Right? And maybe that's uncomfortable. Right? Maybe this partnership says, yes, we acknowledge that you should have twice the voting power, but we don't want you and one other person ganging up and doing things to the other two. So we're going to require that, in fact, you have to come up with uh, at least 66 and a two-thirds percent vote or something like that. In other words, requiring all three, some combination of three, to get you to the uh, uh, required um, um, uh, outcome. I guess 66 doesn't work because that's, uh, uh, that's 75, but you see what I'm saying, okay? Again, you can always alter the default rule on management by agreement, and in most cases people do.
unless they fail to think about it and they, or they just don't have a good lawyer that helps them work through that before uh, they get into their partnership. Okay. The other thing uh, that's an aspect of partnership that um, we should talk about and, and in relation to default agreements is this, is that every partner is an agent of the partnership. Okay. Now that is something that, in other words, every agent, every partner has the authority to bind the partnership, uh, to create liabilities or obligations that bind the partnership provide that it's in the usual course of business of the partnership. Okay? Now this applies to both contract and tort. Okay? So if a partner does something wrongful in the scope, within the context of the business, that liability will extend back to the partnership. Okay? If a partner signs an agreement with a third party that's typical for, and, and consistent with the usual course of business of the partnership, that contract will be binding on the partnership. And now what's interesting about that is, uh, uh, one, that that's not a, uh, a, a, a fact that you can alter by contract, right? So uh, third parties, absent knowledge to the contrary, can assume that anyone you hold out as a partner has that power, right? Because they are deemed to be agents, uh, whether or not they actually have the authority, right? So it's a notion that's an extension of the notion of apparent authority, right? So it's not... Uh, waivable or uh, not restrictive, you can't, not, not, not changeable, <laughs> right? They are agents of the partnership. And why that's significant uh, is obviously it poses a challenge in uh, making sure that the people you give the title partner to, or people who you become partners with, whether or not they have the title, uh, have to be people you're comfortable having that ability to bind your partnership. And it goes beyond simply the binding the partnership, which is bad enough, but the other aspect of it is that agents, I'm sorry, partners are jointly liable for the debts of or the obligations of the partnership, right? And, frank, and actually it's in most cases jointly and severally liable for the obligations of the partnership, which means that uh, they share in all those debts and in fact can be held individually liable for all of them, <laughs> right? So it's even more extreme than you would think, right? It's not just they own their pro rata share of the obligation that gets created. They actually stand behind all of it and a, someone who is uh, uh, looking to collect from the partnership can collect from an individual partner, right? And then uh, the part, individual partner has to worry about collecting from his fellow partners and if he can't, well, he's out of luck. Right. There's a notion of exhaustion that you just should be aware of, and that asks whether or not a creditor first has to go after the partnership and sell off the land and the money and all that first before they have to go after the um, individual partners or are allowed to go after the individual partners, but that's, uh, which obviously makes a difference, uh, and that rule differs from state to state, but that's, uh, that's a detail. The basic idea that you have to keep in mind is that Partners are jointly, and in most cases, jointly and severally liable for the debts and obligations of the partnership. And those debts and obligations can be created by any partner uh, in the firm. Right? So that's one of the great downsides of the partnership arrangement. So given this rule of joint and several liability, and uh, the um, fact that any one partner can create these obligations that then in turn might become solely yours effectively because you happen to be the partner with some kind of money. You know, why would anyone create a partnership? Why, why do it? Right? And uh, that's a good question. Um, often the answer is they didn't mean to or they didn't think about it or they didn't get good advice and so they end up with that kind of exposure uh, un unwittingly. But one very salient fact that uh, we will focus on when we start talking about the other kind of entities that is very significant is the notion of pass-through taxation. Okay? Um, and just very quickly, so you understand the idea, let's give you an example. Right? So let's say you have a non-pass-through entity, and we're going to talk about some of them, and they tend to be things like corporations. 
although there's exceptions to that, right? A non-pass-through entity sells $100 worth of stuff. It costs it in expenses, you know, $60 to do that, and it has a net uh, operating income of 40 bucks. okay? Well, a non-pass-through entity is then going to pay tax on that $40, right? And let's just assume it's a 30% uh, tax, right? So that would be, uh, right, 30% uh, would be $12, right, roughly. And then, uh, so that leaves it with uh, $28 of net income inside the business available now to distribute to its owners, okay? And we call owners in a corporation shareholders. Okay. Now, a pass-through entity, so if this were a partnership instead of a corporation, right, would not have to pay this tax and instead would be able to distribute the full $40 to its partners as opposed to the 28, right? And the reason it can do that is because under the tax code, certain entities, and we'll see that partnerships are not unique, have this pass-through status where it is deemed to be the income of the individual partner, not the entity, uh, that's earned uh, at this level, right? So in other words, instead of getting only $28 and then having that included in my income as a shareholder and taxed again as shareholder income, we simply take the $40 that my entity owns and is being ignored for tax purposes and pretend I own it and then I pay whatever my tax rate is on that, again, probably roughly 30%, and I end up left with $28 as opposed to $28 minus taxes. Okay. So here we talk about it being taxed twice, double taxation, and that's one of the wraps on corporations, whereas here there's only a single level of tax because we don't tax it at the partnership level. We bring it up and deem this income to be the income of the individual partner, and therefore it's a pass-through entity, right? Now that sounds pretty attractive, right? And you would think, wow, that, that ought to be why um, uh, people form partnerships and explain why they take on the risk of joint and several liability and such. Uh, but the truth is uh, that's not a good explanation because the same tax pass-through uh, taxation treatment we will see is available in other uh, entities that don't have the joint and several liability exposure that a partnership has. And so uh, that's um, uh, not a good answer. Uh, another answer is one that I think is worth showing you, and that's this. Because remember, I told you that partners can be any kind of person, right? And so if you want to have a partnership, but you want to avoid personal liability that comes with being a partner, right? What do you do? Well, you own your partnership through some kind of limited liability entity, right? Me, you, and we'll own something like a limited liability company or a corporation, and we'll let those entities be the partner in our partnership so that if something comes through to bite you, it stops here, right? At the limited liability entity. And again, this is getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because we haven't yet talked about limited liability. But I just want you to see that one of the reasons why people still might use partnerships is because there's a way to control this uh, risk of uh, joint and several liability. It's, you do it simply by creating a more complicated structure that inserts a, a liability blocking entity between the individual and the partnership. All right. Now, the truth is there are much more efficient and quick ways of getting to this same result uh, without all this complexity. Uh, you read very quickly about a notion of a thing called a limited partnership. And a limited partnership is a creature of statute where once a legislature has realized that people could get to this result of a entity that was a partnership that used uh, liability blocking entities as a way of avoiding um, the joint and several liability or the personal exposure of the partners, they said, oh, this is silly. Since you can get there anyway through some good corporate lawyering, let's just let them have a one-step solution. And so we're going to create a thing called a limited partnership, 
uh, and then they've created things subsequently like limited liability, uh, limited partnerships, and so on, that are partnerships, but that by statute limit the exposure of the um, partner to the liabilities of the partnership, right? And that's by virtue of the legislature saying that is the fact, right? It trumps the common law rule of um, joint and several liability. Um, one aspect of that, that um, one of the downside, one of the costs of um, being a limited partner that benefits from uh, li uh, limited liability in a limited partnership is that you have to act like a limited partner. So if you cross the line and just call yourself a limited partner, but you start engaging in the day-to-day -day control and day-to-day -day decision making of your limited partnership, uh, in that case, you'll be, uh, they'll ignore your label and treat you as a general partner and then you'll suddenly become exposed to the um, same joint and several liability that you were trying to avoid. Right? Uh, but uh, I just want you to understand that why partnerships might persist is that there are ways of getting their benefits but avoiding this downside of, um, of exposure by you know, just good corporate lawyering. So another question that comes up is what are the consequences of being in a partnership from the point of view of duties that may be owed by um, participants in the partnership? Right? So if partners are agents of the partnership, do they owe fiduciary duties as agents to the partnership? And the answer is yes. In fact, uh, partners are deemed to be in a fiduciary relationship with each other. And very much like uh, the notion of duty of loyalty and duty of care and duty of disclosure and so on that we saw in agency, there are very comparable duties that are owed by partners to the partnership and by the partners to each other. Okay. Um, there is an interesting discussion about whether or not like the managerial rights, like the economic rights, and so on, those are uh, rules that can be um, altered by contract, right? So are these fiduciary duties default rules, or are they uh, that can be altered, or are they hard and fast? Is there uh, some limit beyond which you may not go, right? And I think the prevailing view is that there is substantial room to alter the default rules so that you can essentially waive these fiduciary duties amongst partners, but there does seem to be limits. There do seem to be points at which uh, courts won't go, even if there was a, a very explicit waiver by one partner saying, I don't feel that I need protection from my fellow partners. Uh, but where that line has been drawn is unclear. right? Now, why that is an important issue is it, particularly in the investment partnership context because one of the most uh, common uses for partnerships is to create an entity that takes in money from investors who are usually limited partners. Uh, and that money, when it's pooled together by all these, you know, from these various investors, is managed by the general partner in this partnership who. Uh, is charging a fee for the or a percentage interest for uh, the service of managing all this money, right? And one question that's often asked is, well, can this entity, this manager, manage several pools of money, right, without violating uh, the notion of the uh, uh, duty of loyalty and the restriction on pursuing competitive opportunities, right? And clearly, people who are in the money management business would rather manage lots of pools of money uh, rather than just one pool of money. And so to the extent that there is an inability by using the structure to avoid that obligation, that fiduciary duty, that, wouldn't, that would make it less than ideal as a type of vehicle for um, investment uh, purposes. Uh, and so obviously they've come to the conclusion that they're pretty much free to do that uh, if they want to, if they, as long as they do it explicitly because partnerships are a very common form of organization for setting up these kinds of investment vehicles. NGPs routinely have multiple um, uh, um, funds to manage at the same time. And so they've somehow come 
gotten to grips with how to deal with the corporate opportunity or the partnership opportunity issue. They've somehow avoided the punctilio and, and honor the most sensitive that uh, Cardozo talked about in that situation where there was a uh, piece of jointly owned real estate, right? Um, the other area where these fiduciary duty discussions become very important is in the um, fact pattern that's called a squeeze out. Right? A common problem is when uh, you have, let's say, partner one, partner two, and partner three, and for whatever reason, partner one and two get together and they want to get rid of partner three. Right? And they do it either by expelling them, by dissolving the partnership, right? or otherwise taking actions that result in this person getting cut out. Right? And often the reason that uh, partner three is complaining about partner one and two doing it is because uh, partner three believes that what partner three ends up with when they're expelled or cut, dissolved or cut out is worth less than what uh, it would be worth to stay involved in the partnership and that that spread, right, the, the value that they're not getting, right, the, the, the less than full value that they're not getting is being kept by partner one and two, right. And you can see how oppression might arise when uh, you have a basic rule that says majority wins, right. And so if the majority can make decisions that in effect get rid of the minority in this case and can do so at a discounted price, well, you could see why P3 might explain, uh, complain. And the question is, if that is what's going on, is there a fiduciary duty between uh, the majority or the other partners and the minority that allows the minority shareholder to complain that they're not being dealt with in good faith and consistent with the notion of fair dealing? Can you quote Cardozo as a way of um, preventing that activity? And that's a very uh, common uh, debate. Now, on the other hand, uh, you have to balance that issue and that fear with the possibility that P3 is really a nuisance and is a destroyer of value and someone uh, that P1 and P2 should be allowed to get rid of. Now, the default rule in common law was that partners could not get rid of partners. That was not something that a majority vote would allow to happen. But uh, statutes have been adopted in several states that do, in fact, allow expulsion under certain limited circumstances, like when this person's become a real, real troublemaker or is failing to live up to their obligations to fund uh, losses or what have you. Uh, and so one of the questions is, is overlaying that contractual right or statutory right, and you know, it's very common also to put into a well-drafted agreement a way to you know, get rid of partners that are not working out, like in the law firm context. And the question is, is overlaid on that power, whether it's statutory or contractual, some kind of uh, fiduciary obligation that um, restricts how freely um, the majority can deal with the minority. And that's a, a significant issue we see over and over again in the partnership context. And we'll see it again in the corporate world as well. So a final aspect of partnership that we should um, have a basic understanding of is dissolution. Right? This is basically the end of the road for a partnership. Uh, the default rule, and this is an interesting um, backdrop, backdrop because it's frankly uh, almost never the case that this is the rule in a partnership, but the default rule was that the minute one partner, just one, left the partnership, uh, the partnership that was, uh, that, that w from which there was withdrawal was in dissolution, right? And the consequence of dissolution, absent some other agreement, is that it leads to a liquidation, right? right? So let's understand that for a second, okay? So if we have dissolution, absent some other uh, uh, provision, agreement, or um, some other rule, which we'll talk about some examples, uh, the normal course of what happens is liquidation. And why is that? Well, when a partnership is about to end, right, the idea is to kill the box, right? And so all the assets and all the liabilities need to get settled up. And the way you do that is you sell the assets for money, 
right? And the money then comes into the firm, right? and the assets go out. And that money then gets applied in what is called a waterfall, right? And this is how, this is, this is the process we call winding up, right? So first you take the assets, you sell them, you get money for them, right? So they're gone now, and now you have the money left. And then you have all these obligations that you have to take care of, right? And so you send them out by giving money to the people who are creditors of the business, okay? And those creditors are first paid the outside creditors, and then second, the inside creditors, the partners who've lent money to the partnership. They get paid, and their debts get satisfied, and so those go away. And so what you have left is um, the net worth, if you will, of the business, right? Now, if for some reason the liabilities are more than the assets in a winding up, well, what happens? Well, remember, partners are jointly and severally liable for the obligations of a partnership. So, in fact, if there wasn't enough from this sale to pay these liabilities, partners would actually have to contribute money into the partnership in order to uh, fulfill the uh, obligation to pay these um, uh, debts. And, that's because you would imagine it makes sense because otherwise they'd be personally, jointly, and severally liable. So in the wind-up process, they take care of it collectively. It's, um, but let's assume that's not the case. Let's assume there's extra money. So then the question is what happens to that? Well, the next step is for whatever amount is in our respective as partners capital accounts, right? And what those are is, uh, yeah, I think, uh, too complicated to discuss at the moment. But basically, it's a little account we keep at the firm that measures the money we put in originally minus the money we've taken out minus our allocated profits over time. That's the basic idea. But it's basically our economic claim uh, based on the money we've put in to date, less the money we've taken out. So that gets settled, right? So whatever that account is, we take that off the table. And then if there's anything left, uh, that's our profits, they get distributed, again, based on whatever the rule is in, in effect about sharing um, uh, the profits in the partnership. And again, the default rule would be even Stephen, equal shares. But if uh, we'd written a different agreement, that would also, uh, we'd follow that different agreement, right? So that's the waterfall, and that's what winding up looks like, right? Basic idea, right, is take the entity, sell off the assets, take the proceeds, pay down the liabilities, and take what's left over and distribute it to the profits, uh, to the partners, first in respect of their capital accounts, and then second, finally, a distribution of any distributed profits. That's, that's the idea. Okay. Now, why might that be a bad thing? <laughs> well, Suppose a uh, dissolution happens at a time when the company's assets are less than its liabilities, right? And you'd say, well, okay, tough luck, right? But that's a very common situation, especially for a company early in its life, where um, while it has not accumulated a lot of um, assets, it's still a very valuable business, and that its future makes it more valuable uh, than what is represented by what you would get in liquidation, right? So think of an example. Uh, someone starts a software firm, right? What would the assets minus the liabilities of a software firm be? What can you sell the software for? Probably if it's not yet finished yet and being sold very uh, well, nothing. And yet you have all these liabilities, you've accumulated debt and rent and employment obligations and so on. And so in that context, even though that software may one day turn out to be worth billions of dollars, um, you will go through liquidation and get very little, and the individual partners will get very little. Right? And so what would happen if partner three were to die right, early in this venture? Well, if the, under the default rule, that will trigger dissolution, which would in turn trigger liquidation, which in turn would trigger winding up. But what partners one and two would really like to have happen is for them to be able to take over the business and keep it going because what they'd rather not see is a fire sale of their assets and uh, paying down the liabilities. What they'd rather see is an ongoing business that they get to keep um, up and running. Right? And 
What happens in most cases, if you think about it, if you don't end up with the default rule, is that by agreement, you modify the default rule and say, hey, if someone leaves, right, uh, this is what happens, but what does not happen is dissolution, right? What happens, or if there is dissolution, there's a right for the remaining partners to continue the business in a successor partnership so that it doesn't force a winding up, a sale of the assets and uh, pay down the liabilities, right? That is definitely, in most cases, uh, the preference, right? And that's usually what gets dictated by some form of agreement. If the reason why uh, uh, the dissolution is being triggered is not is because of something that's the fault of the person departing, even if the partnership had not dealt with the question of what happens upon departure, like whether there's a right to continue, this notion of a wrongful dissolution um, and what that means is dissolution that's triggered by reason of a breach of duty by the one partner or by a breach of the partnership agreement by that partner, right, triggers a special course of action. It does not automatically trigger the same dissolution liquidation winding up process. But what it does is it makes the departing person liable for damages, right, so whatever the actual damage are that are caused by uh, that whatever breach they uh, committed. And then it gives the remaining partners, right, very similar to the right we assume you would give yourself if you thought about this and did it by agreement, the right to continue the partnership by repurchasing this partner's interests. So you don't have to run a liquidation. You get to buy this person out, right? And, and what you have to pay that person is the fair value of their interest. And there's some debate in, among uh, the cases about whether or not that includes, quote, goodwill or whether it's liquidation value or what have you and most modern statutes are approaching it as fair value and we'll talk about that and what that means the differences later but uh, historically it had been actually liquidation value so you get stuck with what you would have gotten in liquidation these guys get to keep the rest and that actually usually tends to be a good deal right and so uh, that's why there's lots of litigation about whether or not something uh, was a wrongful departure on the part of one partner, because that triggers these special rights to buy them out. Right? So in either case, what happens if uh, there is dissolution, okay, and the partnership gets continued by a group of um, uh, non-departing partners? Okay. Well, uh, what happens to the departing partner in terms of their joint and several liability for the partnership? Well, number one, to the extent that there are any obligations of the partnership arising before the departure, they still remain liable, just as they would under the uh, uh, rule of joint and several liability. Right? The uh, existing creditors of um, the partnership that existed before the continuation become creditors of the new entity or the continued entity, right? And to the extent that the new entity brings on new partners, they become liable to the carryover uh, uh, um, creditors to the extent of the value of the assets inside the partnership on the day they join, but they don't become personally liable beyond that amount. Right. So that's just uh, something to think about. What happens to the joint and several liability once there is a dissolution that does not result in a winding up? Because one of the benefits of a winding up is, by definition, you're taking care of all the liabilities. Right? That's one of the processes of winding up. But if you're not going to take care of the liabilities because you're trumping this usual default rule, either by agreement or because it's a wrongful dissolution and therefore the law gives these guys the right to continue and just buy this guy out, uh, what are the rules about what that joint and several liability looks like uh, in the new uh, post-dissolution continued entity? And those are the rules. Again, um, withdrawing partners, the departing partners remain liable on all pre-departure obligations of the partnership, 
the creditors that are, were there before dissolution become creditors of the surviving or new entity, and any new partners come on board are liable for the pre-existing debt, but only to the extent of their interest in the partnership assets, uh, not personally beyond that. Okay. Um, that's it. That's the uh, introduction to partnership.